through which the inexhaustible energies of the cosmos pour into the cultural human manifestation. The ancient Greeks resonated with the symbolism of thread, and here we have the Greek fates. This is a bronze, bronze sundial in Brook Green Gardens of Murals Hamlet, just north of us. It's done by Paul Manchin, called Time and the Fates of Man. And the first uh, fate is Clotho here. Whoops. Um, I just want to show you. Clotho is holding, that's her distaff right there. And the Greeks thought, when you're born, the formless turns into form, and a thread comes into being. And Lachesis is the second Greek fate, and she measures this thread of life, and sometimes she weaves it. And then Ragos is at the end bent over, and she has her trusty shears. And at the end of our life, it is said that she cuts the thread, and we die. Now here's a painting of the Greek fates done, uh, it's called Gathering in the Stars, and this was done by Better. And if you'll notice, this was uh, done by Better in the 1800s. And if you notice, the fates are gathering in the stars, and they're, they're a fabric. They're just pulling it in, and um, very much fabric that's winding around. And in the foreground, there's a distaff, a spindle, and shears. And these are the tools of the fates. This is what is needed to create in life, in them. In this painting by artist <coughs> Myron Craighead, this depicts a creation myth of Native American spider woman. And Myron writes, In the beginning, there was nothing but spider woman. And she spun two threads, and where they crossed, she sat singing. And her singing made everything and held it all together. Our Egyptian, or the Egyptian goddess Neph was said to have woven the cosmos and um, the heavens. And you'll notice that object over Neph's head. Many scholars believe this is a weaving shuttle. And I inserted a loom shuttle from 300 BC to the upper left. And then below that is another loom shuttle. It looks very much like a shuttle over Neph's head. We have the Norse goddess Frigga who was said to have spun the clouds. And Orion's belt is also known as Frigga's spinning wheel. And that's because I think the uh, Orion constellation near the equator, the stars spin around. And so the spinning of the stars was like Frigga was in the sky spinning. The Japanese have a sun goddess named Amat Terasu, and it's said that she woke the sunbeams. And here we have a picture of the Virgin Mary, the angel Gabriel. And this is by John William Waterhouse. And if you'll notice off to Mary's side, there we have the distaff. She's spinning thread. Here's a painting of the pregnant virgin. And again, Mary is spinning thread. And so you start to see some similarities with the Greek clotho. Um, the thread, oops, sorry, I keep getting my laser mixed up. The thread is coming up here, the distaff is up here, it's coming through her finger. So in all cases, the thread is coming from on high, it crosses her womb, and it goes down into the spindle, or comes into the womb. Bless you. Uh, here's a German painting of the spinning virgin, and the very same thing, the thread from on high, coming down, crossing across her womb and coming into the form of thread. And you can't tell it very well, but that's a picture of Jesus inside her womb. This is Michelangelo's. It's called the Madonna of the Distaff or Madonna of the Yarn Winder. And I pointed out that Yarn Winder and Distaff earlier because that is what Jesus is holding in this painting that looks very much like a cross, that it is a distaff. And in essence, if you think about it, he is holding his fate in his hands. This is Eve spinning, and her son Cain is at her feet. This comes from a psalter in a church from the 1100s. 
So again, this idea of um, thread and the creation story. Now, it wasn't enough for me to go look at all the myths that I mean, I also wanted to check into what science and medicine had to say about thread and the symbolism of thread. This is a strand of DNA, and we call that the thread of life. The string theory of physics suggests that everything in the universe is comprised, comprised of subatomic vibrating strings. The physicist Brian Greene uh, wrote the book Fabric of the Cosmos, and he wrote this about string theory. And so it seems like our cosmos behaves more like a piece of cloth than it actually does a machine. I went on the internet and I found this photo. It's uh, from the Hubble, and it's an actual photo of galaxies. And I just think this is so beautiful. Uh, but I juxtaposed it to Vedder's painting. And I just think the similarities are remarkable. Don't forget, Vedder painted his painting in the 1800s. So um, I do think this gives some validity to the collective unconscious or something that he was tapping into, right down to you know the foreground of how that fabric comes in and the idea of the, the stars being like fabric. This is De La Tour's painting of the newborn. And birth is another of life's miracles. And since the dawn of time, every new life and each one of us have come into the world dangling from a thread. And so I concluded from all of this research that thread truly was the embodiment of the creation archetype. And perhaps thread was not such a puny response, and that people would resonate on a collective and archetypal uh, with this archetypal symbol that ran so deep through our culture. So I came up with this quote: "Some say our thread, or some say our world is hanging by a thread, but I say a thread is all we need, because we know now that's not such a puny thing." And so I founded the Thread Project. And the mission of the Thread Project is to celebrate diversity, to encourage tolerance, and to promote compassionate community. And my idea was very much like the beginning that I bumped into in Lincoln Center, <coughs> that I would invite people to send in a 12 to 18 inch piece of thread, and I would do this worldwide. And this thread was supposed to represent their hope for the world, a prayer for the world. And it was also my hope that they would share these stories together in community when they could. And they could tell where their thread came from, because some of these were very special and personalized threads, as you'll find out as I have on. Or what that thread symbolized for them. Now, to get the word out, I had to uh, do a website. We have Cookie Monster here going, oh no, delete cookies. But um, it would have been impossible to do this project without the internet. And I find it very interesting that we call this internet that connects all of us the world wide web. What is that? The threads of weaving. Um, I invited people to become thread ambassadors. And as thread ambassadors, they would collect threads from families and friends and organize community tie-ons. And dozens of schools like this one participated. This is one of the schools in Pennsylvania. And what the teachers did in this case is have all the kids in their classrooms. They were to do a kindness in their life at home and then bring in a thread. And as they tied their threads together, they would share with everybody what their kindness was. And then the classes tied together, and then they did a whole school parade outside. And you can see they're all now, after they've joined their threads, they've collected together. Um, these threads came from the Iron Middle School in Zebo, China. And 
this school found out about the thread project from a sister school in the United States. Here we have a kindergarten class in Israel, and again you see them winding in and around their threads. Here's an art class in Greece. Many schools it would uh, print the children's names on the cloths, cut them into strips, and wind them into balls. And I started to know what was happening uh, because people started sending me letters about their threads and telling me all the different um, people who had contributed. So often it was a memory of someone. And this slide isn't the best, but. I brought this because this was a fiber that was picked up in the killing fields of Cambodia. And it was sent to me with a letter that said, I dedicate this to all who died there. The letter that came with this thread said, enclosed is a strip of fabric woven in one of Mother Teresa's leopard colonies. If people who have no fingers and toes can learn to weave, any of us can learn whatever we must to make it through. We are on. And just when I thought no one could send me a more unique thread, another one would arrive. And I think one of the more intriguing um, threads that I received was what somebody said was a string from a moose calling can. So I don't know what a moose calling can is. But I'm proud to say we have a string from it in one of these quads. And um, here's a partial list of some of the more un unusual fibers that end up being woven into some of these panels. You know, we have um, animal fur, there's a piece of bicycle tire, a um, piece of World War II parachute. We ended up, lots of fishing line. Guys like to give us fishing line, which was great. But we ended up with threads from every continent, including Antarctica, which I was uh, really glad to get that Antarctica thread. As these threads began to come in, a lot of them would just come in in envelopes and tie. And uh, we had to tie them all together with a certain knot that would unravel and then turn them into balls. And my husband, Jim, would sit there at night watching TV, tying, I don't know how many thousands of threads that he tied and became part of this project. But um, I was very appreciative. And as we tied these threads together, please come on in, sit. <laughs> um, these threads would be rolled into the balls. And in the, with the thread that was being rolled, I called it the unity because that is the one that was uniting all of us. And I'll explain a little bit about weaving to get it, so you get an idea. Because now, after we had these, it was time to weave. This is a picture of a primitive loom, but it shows how cloth is woven. The warp threads are the individual north-south threads. They go up and down like this. These threads were donated by a thread company. They donated all our thread for the work, which gives each of these claws their color, the yellow, the blue, and the turquoise back here. The wet thread that we were tying together that you saw in the balls, it, is, it stays one long thread, and it goes back and forth, back and forth. And right here on number six, that's a weaving shuttle, and that's very much like a weaving shuttle that we use for most of our claws. And you tie the thread around that, and it travels up the loom. And really, it is just one thread, the unity thread that goes up. This is an actual panel that shows the purple warp. And um, we can see the thread whoops, uh, right here on the shuttle that goes back and forth. Well, it was at this point that I had decided, I had the great idea that we are going to be seven claws seven panels wide, seven feet long, and seven different colors. And obviously the number seven was important to me, but seven is the number of completion. We have seven continents that make one world. We have seven notes on a diatonic musical scale, seven colors in the spectrum of light, seven days in our week. Now, there was only one problem with this plan that I had to do all this weaving of these claws, which would be 49 panels. 
And that problem was I was not a weaver and I didn't know anything about weaving. And nor am I an artist. So there were a few things that, you know, <laughs> I am a believer though that ideas come to the willing and not necessarily the qualified. I believed I could find the resources that I would need to do this. And I only needed to find 49 weavers around the world, which I didn't know any. Well, I was lucky enough to find the first weaver, Judith Crone. She's on the right. She's in Atlanta. And she agreed to be the weaving consultant for our project and to come up with how many threads and dimensions of everything that we could save uh, to send to the weavers. And Trisha's in the center, Trisha Summit. Um, she is my friend, and she was also a thread ambassador, because that's me on the side. While I was doing my research um, on weaving, I came across this section. This is part of the frieze in the Parthenon, and it depicts an Athenian girl, and she's holding a colossal woven peplos, this square thing right here. Every four years in Athens, young girls would get together and weave one of these peplos to drape over a 40-foot statue of Athena that stood in the Parthenon. Now, Pausanias is a first century Greek writer, and he wrote that there were also 16 women who gathered every four years to weave a giant peplos for the goddess Hera. Uh, Pausanias believed that these women coming together to weave a communal cloth served the purpose of keeping peace and goodwill in the land, because they would come from different tribes but they would work on this one cloth together. And I thought, you know, that's exactly the intention that I would love our weavers to have as they are weaving these threads together. So we're going to get weavers from around the world. And that they're weaving not only these threads, but to really imagine and intend that they're also weaving peace and goodwill for the world. It was not easy to locate these weavers, and the search was ongoing throughout the project. When I did find a weaver, I would send them the warp and weft threads and then enough money to mail the camel back to me. We sent the same specifications to every weaver, and invariably I would say, if you know of any other weavers that might be interested, you know, please be in touch or send their names. And so we've been on some weavers in India. This is what they're on. Um, this is a Argana weaver, and she set up this loom. You'll see all the looms are all different kinds of shapes and sizes, which is quite wonderful. And this was in school, and some of these students were able to weave a couple of rows on this cloth. And this is the same weaver with her son and her cloth when it's finished before she sent it back to him in the States. We found weavers in Australia. El Salvador, Israel. And I love this one. This is Suri Provisor. And she set her loom up outdoors on the hillside near Shiloh. And Suri wrote me and she said, when I wove my panel, I wove it as if it were a Jewish prayer shawl. And that required her to take a blue thread and tie it at the top of the loom in the very top left hand corner. And so one of these panels is very much a prayer show. Eventually, we located weavers in 14 countries from five continents and 17 states in the United States. Now, what I thought I'd do is give a brief history of each of the seven cloths. And we will take a break and come back. But, um, I'll tell you when that's going to happen. This is the first cloth, Hope materializing. And um, this was the direct response after 9-11. It took several years for these costs to be over, but I felt that I must be, and maybe what other people must be, and I think what John spoke to, to start healing, is we need our hope. We need not to give up, because if we can't hope, then, um, you know, you can't, if you can't hope, you can't vision for something to happen. So we decided to weave the very first panel of the project on the winter solstice, 
which, as you know, is the longest night of the year. And I invited women together in a circle. You can see the Christmas tree behind us there. And the idea was that we were going to ritually bless the weaving of these cloths on the solstice, asking that light and consciousness also be woven into the world. And we have a minister giving a blessing. And then here's the sunlight uh, falling on the first panel that was being woven on the loom. And I named that purple cloth hope materializing because of Elpis. Now, most of us are familiar with Pandora's box, the story, and a lot of times it was actually a jar that Pandora opened. But we don't hear a lot about Elpis, which is also part of the Pandora story. Elpis is the personification of hope. And when Pandora loosed the elves into the world, Elpis was left behind clinging to the rim of the jar. And it shut. And so Elpis is crying and crying and crying, and she wants to be let out. Because I think she knew that a world without hope was a world condemned to despair. And so she was released into the world as well. My friend is a clay artist named Susan Riles, and she agreed to make some clay buttons for these pots to attach these panels together. And the ones on hope materializing spell hope in different languages around the world. And this button is a, um, it spells the Serbian word for hope, which is not. So you see N, which is symbol A, D, A. And so we have these in different languages. One of the panels for the purple cloth were, um, it was woven in Guatemala. And it was woven by Mayan weavers on a back strap loom. And I feel very fortunate that we got a panel woven in this way because that's a technique that's thousands of years old and just mainly indigenous people know how to, to weave in this method because the woman becomes part of the loom and the tension is created by her body. And so I was told that the whole village participated in the weaving of this panel. And you can see the men are gathered around as well. And men were invited to help weave to, uh, to work on the paws. The next plot was the red one. And this was called Thread and Harmony. And you notice that even though I gave everybody the right dimensions and directions, and, you know, they weren't all even. My little perfectionist kind of oh my goodness, Judith, they're not even in Jesus terror. Let these flaws teach you. It's going to be so much more interesting if you just allow this. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> I guess I can trust that, you know, my little perfectionism. And so, um, they, and they were, they're so much more interesting. But you just let the flaws teach you. Uh, some panels of this cloth were woven at a county fair, and all people that came to the county fair, anybody that wanted to, could sit down and weave some panels. Some were put up in the library. 